Welcome to my commentary of Game 5. We're nearly at the halfway mark of this year's World Chess Championships. We have the challenger, Fabiano Caruana, and he is facing Magneto Carlsen, the reigning champion, one of the most talented, if not the most talented, chess player of all time. And today we had some fireworks today was a brilliant game in my opinion i mean there was pretty much everything we could have hoped for crazy opening um some complications unbalanced position and some fighting but also rather peculiar game at certain moments to start with though let's move on to the opening so these guys when fabiano has been white have been battling in this variation of the bishop b5 sicilian now i wish i wish i wish upon a star that white would just play d4 and play the open sicilian but uh i really would love to see some open sicilian slugfest um but fabiano played another aggressive idea albeit in the close rossellimo variation of the sicilian he stuck to his guns with bishop b5, and this is the third time this position has occurred so far in this World Championships. Magnus played g6, again sticking to his guns. And only around here do we see a new tactic from Fabiano. Rather than taking on c6, which has been his go-to idea so far, and this position, this pawn structure has occurred, only now does he castle kingside and he avoids capturing on c6 so we get quite distinctively different positions than we have done so far these this pawn structure of blacks he hasn't got the double pawns but white doesn't hasn't given up his bishop bishop g7 played okay why not control in the center rook to e1 in this position and this allows the bishop sometimes to drop back here the rook is on a nice central square and now black plays e5. And, and this is a dark square strategy from Magnus. He's doing everything to control the dark squares in the centre of the board. But of course, when you control one colour squares, you leave the other colours weak. So the light squares around here are quite weak now. And I was commentating on this with David Howe on my Twitch channel. Uh, David Howe knows both of these players well. 2700 player and he was saying he normally plays either knight c3 going for the light squares or c3 here trying to go for d4 and the next move came as a real shock to both of us and and probably to the chess world out there in this position fabiano now lashed out with what i would say is something that made me extremely excited b4 Offering a pawn. This pawn can be taken in two ways. It can be taken by the pawn on c5 or the knight. It's a wing gambit, a pawn sacrifice. Well done, Fabiano. I like your spirit. You're coming at him from the sides. Bit old-fashioned romantic play. But the thing with chess nowadays is even moves like this have probably been analysed and it became clear from the speed that Magnus was moving that this... This move must have been um, analysed by Magnus. So Magnus showing some good preparation here. The point is, if you take on b4 with a pawn, white will play a3 here. And this is a bit like a Benko gambit. If black takes there, the bishop captures and white has good compensation on the a file and also across this diagonal towards the king. Just to remind you what a Benko gambit is, this only take a second. When you're playing chess, you've got to notice similarities in patterns, even if they're completely different openings with different colors. And the Benko gambit is where black plays b5, white captures, black plays a6, and at some point you get this kind of structure, bishop cutting across, rook on the open file. And, you know, if you want to become a better chess player, you've got to notice patterns. Chess is a game of patterns. So that's the idea with pawn takes. Therefore, black captures with the knight here. Now, a couple of interesting ideas. I would have thought c3 and d4 is one way that uh, Fabiano could have gone for glory here. 
Instead, he banged out bishop b2, attacking the pawn here. Black would very much like to play d6, but the pawn is pinned, so he plays a6, trying to get rid of the bishop so he can play this move. Fabiano keeps playing aggressively, and I, I love this way of playing. Fabiano today clearly just went for it, and this is spirited stuff. If Fabiano wants to win this World Championships, he's got to play fearlessly, as he has done in the opening here. If he holds back, I think he's going to lose the rapid play. Uh, Magnus is much better at the tie-break stage. So he needs to play like this. This is his one chance to go for it. Wing gambit. Go for it. Play aggressive. So I can only applaud this. A3. And now a very sharp series of events. Pawn takes B5. Pawn takes B4. The rooks are opposing opposite each other. So we have rook takes A1. Chaos at the board. Bishop takes smash bang bollop. Everything getting exchanged. D6. Guarding the pawn on C5. More violence. Pawn takes c5. Magnus must have had this prepared. There's a number of ways black can go wrong here. He needs to get his king castled. His king is not castled. The knight is in the way. Get the knight out of the way. Knight e7. Queen e2. Targeting the pawn on b5. b4. Nope. You can't have my pawn for free. You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to fight for that pawn. Queen c4. Both players still playing quickly, so they've obviously analysed this line. White wants to win this pawn. Magnus now plays a very, a very... I mean, this is a very brave very brave play from Magnus as well. Because the next move, Queen A5, guarding the pawn, is brave because it allows this little guy, which has done a very brave adventure all the way along these, this sideline, to come into D6. Fascinating position. Black's king is an immediate danger, so Black is the player at the moment who has to be very careful how he plays this position for example there are a number of ways you can go wrong i mean knight c6 we were analyzing me and david how the sacrifice with d4 here i want to strike while black's king is not castled knight g5 was also an idea trying to go for f7 but i like this move queen takes a1 grabbing the piece so now there's a couple of ideas here but pawn to d5 being the most aggressive if we can win the piece back and keep our d6 pawn, we're doing well. This knight has to guard the bishop, so something like knight a7. And we came to the conclusion around this moment that even though white is material down, white should have great compensation. This knight is very bad. Even something like queen takes b4 and the other pawn comes rolling up the board. What a brilliant position this would be, but very, very scary for black to face, I think, and maybe just bad for black, even though... Black is material up. These three pawns, when they get there, they are like rocket launchers coming straight towards black. And uh, you don't want to be on the end of those rocket launchers. So bishop e6, again, active play being the best policy. And now, well, it's a pity that white can't really keep the queens on. He has to go for the ending with queen c7. The queens get exchanged and knight c6. And, and around here, Magnus has, has, has played against this novel novel idea with, with extreme preciseness. And I think he must have prepared this. So this is one time Magnus has got his preparation in. One thing we found, I think, so far is that when, when uh, um, Magnus gets over the opening stage and he's been a little bit worse, he suddenly grabs, the, the, the way this match has been going, he grabs a slight edge. But once he grabs the slight advantage, he he hasn't shown so far that killer, that, that killer thing that he used to have. Is this the case here? Well, c3, a very quiet move. Not sure this is correct. We need to get rid of that pawn on, D, on c7. So the king comes across to take it. And around here, after rook a8, white is two pawns up. But it becomes clear that Magnus's understanding of this position it is, is very precise. Even though he's two pawns down, his activity is great. The rook takes an open file. And look at white's pieces. White's pieces are caged in. These two pieces are very, very sadly positioned. If you move the knight here, well, you might just lose this pawn. And the bishop is bad. And after the, game, the move in the game, bishop c3, well, the knight is now bad. This knight is extremely passive. Magnus takes one of his pawns back. Now Fabiano had a 30-minute think of clearly not liking his position. And he played d3 because he wants to get this knight out or at least try to reroute the bishop to d2 and get the knight to c3. 
And around here, you know, Grandmaster David Howe and myself were thinking, well, we like Black's position. It's one pawn down for Black, but the extra pawn is pointless. It's It can't move at the moment. White has the problem with his pieces, and Black's pieces, control of the open line, looking good. So we were starting to think, hang on a minute, we like, we like Black here. Can Magnus convert one of his small, small edges? David suggested what I think is a very clever move, pawn to b5. And if you remember yesterday's game, this is an idea that Fabiano played against Magnus, and the same thing. He played this move, and again, it's showing patterns, how patterns relate to each other. Remember ideas, remember patterns, you'll better use them yourself. The idea of it is, is to stop this pawn on b4 from going anywhere, and to eventually attack it, like, like Caruana did. And if you can win that pawn, then your B-pawn runs. And, and I think this would have... I, I, I certainly think Magnus would have had great chances there. In the end, after another very long think, he went to King B6. And another trend I've noticed is that the more Magnus thinks, it seems like when he has a long think, he's playing rather unnatural moves. And they're not working as well. I'm sure he saw B5. And I think he's maybe even thinking himself out of the natural moves. I think he the quicker he plays, maybe the better he plays in some ways. I don't want to be too critical because this is a very tempting move. I mean, the king tries to come in, but it's also very risky. The king is an active piece, but when there's still rooks on the board, your king can get in a lot of trouble as well. So it's a brave decision, but maybe not the correct one. And again, I am being overly critical here. Of course, Magnus has played great so far, and both players are still playing very high quality chess that's why there's been no break in this deadlock so far the game continue now with a very clever move from fabiano the natural move would be something like knight d2 but again if you're following normal things without a purpose and you're not thinking ahead you can get into a lot of trouble this does develop a piece but where is that knight going you've always got to have but know where that piece is going next Maybe it's going to c4, but I, I can stop that with king here, controlling that square. I'm also controlling this square, so your knight's not going anywhere. And also the bishop is very exposed, so I could even come straight in with a rook here. So knight d2, which I think a lot of weaker players would have played, is clearly a bad move. Fabiano's not a weak player. He plays bishop d2, much stronger idea. Because this white knight doesn't want to come to a pathetic square on d2, it wants to come to c3, and then it wants to come jumping into a much more proactive square. Always think of the potential of your pieces. Even if you're behind development, don't develop your pieces to pointless squares. Development is good, but only if they're developed with a purpose. Otherwise, it's pointless. And the next move now is a move that surprised us again. The rook is on an open line. Fabiano is trying to play knight c3 and bishop e3. Why didn't Magnus now put the knight upon d4? This was another puzzling decision. He did not play this. The point is, if this knight is ever captured, look at, the, look at this guy. This guy is sleeping in bed. It can't get into the game. It's completely dead. Black has the advantage of the two bishops, and slowly he can start grinding away here as the open file. The king is coming up the board. So this to me looks very natural. Knight d4. Of course, white probably shouldn't take this knight. But at least now Magnus keeps his rook very active. His rook can come in the game. Knight c3, rook a3, pressurizing. If you play bishop e3, maybe king b5, pressurizing. This seemed like a better way to play for a win for Magnus. Rook d8 hitting d3 now allowed a simplification and Fabiano calculated extremely well seeing that the following end game was okay for him an interesting way he could have played this would have been with knight c3 but this is a little bit risky sacrificing on d3 but now activating this knight and all of a sudden this knight that was very bad on b1 becomes a powerhouse on c5 king b5 knight c5 Attacking, winning a pawn on b7. So this was a very interesting option, but it was a little bit more complex and a little bit more dynamic. I think by this stage, Fabiano was very happy to 
liquidate into a drawn position. I think his open experiment, as brave as it was, you know, uh, they say that being brave, you know, fortune favours the brave, but in some cases it, it, it can also backfire in your face. And this was nearly the position that his opening surprise did not work. It, he came, He came prepared. Magnus had it prepared. It backfired a little bit. He realised this after being brave and, and now he, he decides, right, I tried something. It didn't work out. It's time to play for the draw. Bishop e3 check. The king comes forwards. Magnus also and always a brave player. And now the point behind this, knight to c3 check. And we have liquidation. Had white tried bishop c5, we, we were enjoying some variations here with the idea of knight c3 check and mate. Let's say black plays a stupid move. Knight c3 check, only one square for the king. Rook a1, checkmate is incoming. But had this occurred, bishop c5, it's really a one mover. And black can just go, rook takes d3, getting a pawn. And again, this knight, what is it doing? It's not coming where it wants to come. Magnus in controlling c. So knight c3 immediately must be played before that knight sleeps forever. King takes b4, and now the clever idea, knight d5 check. Forcing pieces to come off the board, that knight has to be removed, that pawn has to be removed, and now winning that one pawn, which has been the bane of white's position. This pawn on b7 is always a threat to white because it always has the possibility of becoming a queen because it's a passed pawn. It's not obstructed by any white pawns. White, therefore, eliminates it through the use of tactics. And here, after knight d8... Rook c7, king takes d3. Yes, Magnus is a pawn up, but his pieces are bad. The knight is passive. This knight can't move, it's tied down. The bishop is bad. The bishop is passive. The king is a good piece in an ending, but only when the king has purpose. In this position, the king actually is in some danger. It has nothing to attack, and you have to be careful here. For example, after king f1, taking away the e2 square. A horrendous move here that Fabiano now played. I kept it till the end. E4, knight E1, checkmate. The biggest blunder in the history of chess. No, he didn't play that. I'm only joking. Come on. He's a good player. He wouldn't fall for that. It's the kind of thing that I'd fall for. Well, it shows the danger of the position. This king has to be a little bit careful. H5 played. Why, did this, why was this move played? Because Fabio wants to go G4. And he wants to stop the white king from running away. I mean, king e4, king to this square was uh, was one move that Carlson could have tried. But unfortunately, knight g5 check and Carlson wins the pawn on f7. It doesn't work. So h5 is aimed at stopping white from playing g4. And the move g4, let's say h6 g4, the move g4 is aimed at stopping the black king from running back to safety. So subtle play. h5, h3, renewing the threat. And now Magnus has had enough here and he thought he needed to force a draw. In actual thing, I think this is wise. Even though Magnus is a pawn up, he has to be very careful. This king is not, not, not happy. You know, and he can't move his knight. He can't really do anything as bishop. His rook is very bad. His king is bad. So this extra pawn is really just, it doesn't matter. It's a pointless pawn. So he thinks, right, I'm going to have to liquidate. I've had my fun. I didn't work. King e4. Knight g5 check. King f5. Fabiano wins his pawn back. They have an exchange on f7. Bishop f6. All pawns on the same area of the board. Equal material. No one can get a passed pawn. If white had a pawn on the a file here, white has chances to win because it's a passed pawn. Not the case. Draw agreed. So an interesting game. Um, I, I, I think, you know, Fabiano comes out fighting with B4. A round of applause to him. Very well prepared. A show of aggression. Magnus clearly had this prepared himself, so he didn't need to spend too much time thinking. And then he starts to take a little bit of control of the position when his king gets to this square. Maybe C3 being a mistake. When, as soon as Magnus does seem to get control of the position around this point, it strikes me he plays a couple of inaccurate moves. King b6 and rook d8. Why take the rook away from the one big open file you have? It doesn't make sense. It's a slight sign of nerves there. And I think going forwards now, a couple of things we can see is that Magnus is showing that 
he maybe has a little bit better chess understanding because he's, he's even if he gets a bad position he's turning it around and turn it to a slightly better position but then he's throwing away his edges straight away in, in most of the games he gets slightly better he's throwing it away Fabiano coming at Carlson now this is the way Fabiano should play Fabiano calculating well keeping his cool probably a slightly better prepared a player maybe that didn't show today so always in with a shout one win will change the whole thing but the biggest challenge is now to come in the next two games games six and seven Magnus has a double white this is like serving in tennis you have the advantage of the first move so it's going to be very interesting if Magnus can get one and a half out of two in the next two games one win in my eyes that'll be an unstoppable advantage to him. So I think Magnus ha is still in a good position, still favourite, but I think he'll be getting frustrated with himself by playing moves like, well, rook d8 and king b6 as he does here. And maybe there's therefore this frustration, it could, it could blow over. He could try too hard, something too drastic. He might take too many risks and it could actually backfire in his face. So very, very interesting second half of the tournament to come well we're still in the first half i'm going to actually go up to london tomorrow i'm going to try to watch the games if i can get in somehow thank you all for watching this short roundup of game five of this 12 game world championship match please do like the video please do subscribe to my channel and if that keeps happening i'll keep making the videos goodbye thank you for watching cheers see you later